Hello, and welcome to episode seven of Root Causes, a Not My Generation podcast. The podcast that hopes to bring a national discussion on the differing intersections of the fight to end gun violence. This is your hosts, Elijah Nichols and Addison Moore from DC. Welcome to Root Causes. Today, we will be discussing class oppression in the movement with sociologist Betsy Leander Wright, a board member of the national anti-classism organization, Class Action, and the author of Missing Class, Strengthening Social Movement Groups by Seeing Class Cultures. If you'd like to learn more about Class Action and the anti-classism work that they do, please go to their website at www.classism.org. Well, welcome, Betsy. How are you doing today? Good. I'm delighted to be with you, Edison and Elijah. And we're happy to have you. So why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself and the work that you do? Sure. Yeah. So um, I've been an activist for over 30 years. And I've had the great good, all different issues, but especially economic justice has been my thing. And I've had the great good fortune of getting to work with wonderful activists across the entire class spectrum of the United States. You know, lots and lots of working class folks and affordable housing work and with unions, very low income people working on uh, welfare budget cuts and um, lots and lots of, of upper middle class environmentalists and feminists and a lot of owning class, wealthy people dedicated to making fairer economy and even the occasional ruling class person. So I think that gives me this kind of unique perspective that whatever your background is, whatever your life story is, you have something to give to the movement for social justice. And it's really, really important that we connect with each other across class divides as well as race divides and other divides. And uh, it's really important that we work together in solidarity. Absolutely, absolutely. So to sort of get this ball rolling, we would love for you to just explain to the listeners and explain to us as well what exactly classism and class oppression is at large. Yeah, so um, in class action, we say we're working for a world without classism, where everybody's basic needs are met and everybody has a voice in decisions that affect their lives. Everyone's treated with respect and dignity, and there's no systemic oppressions of any kind, because we think all the other isms intersect with classism. And what we discover is that progressive activists and liberals and leftists and anarchists, we can pretty much all see classism out there in the economy. So obviously those of us with a critique of capitalism, like corporations and financial institutions, really, really classist, mistreat working people, rules are set up in government for for the benefit of elites and not for people who have to depend on working for a living. So that's almost the easy part in progressive worlds. And the really hard thing to face is that there's classism inside every institution and there's classism inside every institution that has a mission of trying to make things equal and fair. And even in our beloved, very progressive membership organizations, the things we we give our loyalty to as activists, you know, completely run through with classism. So that's the mission of class action is to help organizations become truer to their missions by finding the ways that organizational classism is woven into everything from the culture of the organization, the rules, obviously everything about money, but how meetings are run, everything is full of classism. So when we're talking about classism, when we're talking about the idea of class oppression, I think it'd be really interesting if you could define even like who's impacted by this classism in the most negative way, of course. Right, in the most negative way. So um, obviously people in persistent poverty are unfortunately quite large percentage of people in our country um, whose lives, you know, who miss on really basic needs, lives are destroyed by classism and other oppressions. But, you know, actually all of us are harmed by classism. Even when I was saying I've worked with wealthy people, this kind of society where we're so segregated, there's so much poverty, working people have so little power, that's not the kind of society that they want to live in either. And speaking for myself as a fairly class-privileged person, 
that's not the kind of society I want to live in. So mostly we're talking about um, sort of the equivalent, like if you say sexism and transphobia, uh, you are talking about women and non-binary and trans people being the targeted by the oppression. Mostly we're talking about people in poverty, temporary or long-term, and working people, people who don't have other assets besides their own labor to get them to get their needs met. So yeah, I, I've asked so many organizations, so who are the working class and poor voices in your organization? Are the vo those voices heard? There's often a lot more class diversity in class background than most organizations know. Are there secrets in your group? Pretty much there are, because people at the two ends of the class spectrum are habitually hide things. So things just open up. Energy is freed up when you start talking openly, when you get real about people's current class experience and class background. Oh, thank you for sharing. And I think um, thinking of like how people's labor is really all they have to fall on when thinking of folks who are low income or experiencing poverty. When in our work as like folks who do work in gun violence prevention, we know that that's like a symptom of the way that low income folks are able to, you know, get the care that they need because those basic needs aren't getting met. And understanding that these systems that we have in place don't really necessarily support them being able to thrive. There's not really a culture or a uh, environment where people who are low income are supposed to be getting those basic needs met in the way that we currently run our society right now. And in knowing that, like how people are having to take a violent route to get their needs met because they're not met by, you know, a society that's meant to or is supposed to be meaning to uh, protect them and make sure that they feel uh, safe and supported. What are these systems and structures that reinforce the divisions of classes and how do these show up and what do they look like for folks who are experiencing poverty? Well, of course, the core thing is wages are too low. We've had this slide in the minimum wage, the value of the minimum wage and the average wage that so many other problems, like you're saying, would not be there um, if wages had kept up with the growth of the economy. If, you know, we've gone through this incredible period until very recently of vast economic growth. Like the economy is much bigger. There's much more wealth than there was 20 years ago. And um, who, who got it? You know, the extremes of wealth inequality that disproportionately it didn't just go into like the affluent professional suburbanites like me. My class went up a little bit uh, over these 20 years and it didn't just even go to the top 1%. It went to the top 10th of 1% and the top 100th of 1% that this tiny number of people have all this money that's desperately needed for things like healthcare, higher ed, decent housing. So I think the biggest institutions, obviously, are employers, corporations, um, employers, our complete non-health, our defective healthcare system, our defective education system, that you can have a pretty low income. I don't think poverty, per se, causes violence. Maybe you all disagree. You're more expert on this than me. But there's many places in the world where people have very low incomes but they're given a really good K-12 to education and everybody's got health care. And there's kind of that, that sense of investing communities, like, oh, this community needs a park. Oh, this community needs some youth programs. You know, I think that you can be low income, but be in a supportive community. So, yeah, you know, when people do that shorthand, I'm a little bit of a skeptic Mm -hmm. For a couple of reasons. I, someday I'd love to just learn more from your organization and see if some of my guesses about where gun violence and other violence comes from are right or not. Um, but I, I think it's, I would say, it's the associated breakdown of community that mm -hmm. goes with chronic and deep and institutionalized poverty. There's also, you know, a stereotype that poor people are the ones to commit crime that makes the... Class obliviousness is a component of classism. So you're like, oh, there can't be domestic violence in that family, because look at their nice house, you know, and look what a good job he has. He couldn't possibly be doing that. There's a, an assumption of where the violence is. And I've heard Tim Weiss, the anti-racist um, educator, say this, that like the sense that the pathology is elsewhere 
makes mm -hmm. people miss things. He wrote this really profound stuff on Columbine that it makes you assume, oh, well, those people are fine. And he says it a lot about race, but it's true about class too. We don't have to worry about them. You know, they're white and suburban or they're white and affluent or, well, those are the good kids. It's like violence comes out of every community. And I'm, I'm sure you all talk about that. And the, the, the things that build community help and embed everybody in a set of healthy relationships, there's a need for that at all class levels of our society. Absolutely, absolutely. I think that sort of gets at where we come from with our perspective, um, really with the idea of specifically in the United States and the systems and structures of our non-healthcare system, of our lack of access to healthy foods, our frankly awful housing um, and ways in which we develop in communities. <laughs> Here at Not My Generation, At Root Causes, when we think about um, the ways in which communities are not supported, we look at those systems and structures as the answer. Um, we look simultaneously at being the problem and causing violence to occur because when you live in a place of utter despair, when you um, have to turn to illegal actions to get some sort of um, substance in your life, to get food on the table, to get a house, to get a roof over your head. From my perspective, um, growing up low income, much of my family being low income, and having a relative killed um, because um, of gun violence within the home, because they had to turn to such quote unquote illegal actions to make some sort of income. When I connect the dots between poverty and gun violence and being low income and gun violence, it comes from, like you said, that breakdown of community because there's not a community and structures that support them. I often um, view structures as a way to either reinforce community or to break down community. I mean, I, I'm sure similar to the way that you view and as the policy and advocacy director, that is something I always try to implement into our work. And when we're thinking about policies that we're supporting and when, when we're thinking about um, how we're talking about things really, because again, we know that violence isn't something that's inherent. It is something that comes out of a lack of support. And, and when we're thinking about these systems and structures and the way we talk about it in the gun violence pre prevention movement, it's interesting. So sort of wrap up those thoughts on how we view um, our movement um, and the movement we're trying to build within the gun violence prevention movement, really. I want to hear your input because I know not my generation isn't perfect. I really want to know how we can ensure that every single low-income person, if, if they want to, if they feel like they need to, can become a part of the gun violence prevention movement. I would really love to hear your thoughts on that. So there's a concept, I don't know if you all know Linda Stout, of Spirit in Action, um, who wrote one of the best books ever um, called Bridging the Class Divide. Um, her concept is invisible walls, that it's just the really simple, a lot of the invisible walls are simple logistics of like what time do things happen, you know? Mm -hmm. Like she was an organizer, she grew up in like a, um, a mill town in the South, and there were people trying to organize uh, anti war groups who would schedule meetings when people when the shift at the mill were happening. So she says, just the time, and then things like childcare, transportation, where do you gather? Just everything like that. So a lot it's to do with money, but also time and, and logistics. And then she says, the other invisible wall is language. And this is something that I've written a lot about and Class Action has worked on a lot on, that a lot of social justice efforts talk very abstractly, talk in a, a code that is taught in colleges and um, people of every race and nationality get a little bit homogenized by college and how we speak. And a lot of us speaking again as a, as a white class privileged activist, a lot of us get very, very attached to a certain ideological word that just like wraps up our whole analysis. So for some people it's socialism, for some people it's anarchism, for some people it's, you know, sustainability. Now a lot of people are like, you have to say white supremacy and you have to say a white privilege. And the overemphasis sometimes on these abstract terms and insisting that everybody else line up and say them, that's an invisible wall because there's a really big speech difference um, between working class people and college educated professional people, which is how concrete or how abstract you talk. Um, this cuts across races, regions, everything that working class people 
you know, speak all these fabulous uh, dialects and, you know, local and, and ethnic slang. But what they all have in common is more of an emphasis on storytelling, more of an emphasis on humor, more concrete imagery and examples and analogies. And what professional middle class college educated people have in common is it's a little drier. It's often really good for summarizing things, wrapping things up. It's not that it's a bad speech code at all, but it's when it becomes that um, speech police thing that that is classist and sometimes racist too, depending on who you're directing it at. But I think a lot these days, it's like, well, I, I work with these white working class people and I can't get them to admit that they have class privilege. It's like lots of white working class people know perfectly well that if they were a person of color, a lot of things would be a lot harder. Their friends and colleagues and neighbors of color have run into obstacles they don't run into and but are not going to call their relative racial advantages the word, by the word privilege because that sounds like you're a, you know, membership has its privileges. If people have had a hard life, that word is a hard sell. I got to say, like, I don't push it because it's, the important thing is the understanding of racism and how, how embedded it is, how pervasive it is. So anyway, that's just an example of how I think this, how there's classism, not in the language, but in the, in this group, we have to use this language. So that's an example of what Linda Stout would call an invisible wall. Wow, that, I think that's really, a really great way to think about it as well, like thinking of Specifically thinking of language and like how that makes a movement accessible, because uh, we've touched on it in, in past episodes as well, um, talking about how to make a movement accessible. But I think, yeah, language can be, it can make or break someone's understanding, because yeah. if we're using these bigger concepts, it can be hard for someone who may not be there yet to really understand, because it's not necessarily the word that's important, but it's the, what the word means that it's really important that's to right. understand. I really enjoy like hearing that because I work in different movements. Like I do GVP work, but I also work with LGBTQ youth and um, some of the same things that we're talking about here. I see it. There's a lot of intersections with other groups where I see that there's language can make or break people's understanding of these really big, large issues that are really hard to understand. um, If you don't look at uh, not the word, but, everything under the word. I think that that's, that's so important to understand. And who do you consider the great communicators within your organization? I've seen it over and over again, decade after decade, that like, oh, that person is so polished. Let's have them be the speaker. Mm-hmm. You know? And like missing, like, yeah, but first of all, this person has lived with the problem more, but also listen to how, listen to how they talk. They'd be great with this audience. They'd be, they, you know, they're, they're funny, they're a storyteller, like overlooking the great communicators because our image of a leader is influenced by classism. I think that 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 makes a lot of sense. I'm just thinking of all the times. I don't know, Elijah, if you've experienced this or if you either, Betsy, like when you're just starting in advocacy work and they're like, ah, yes, these are the speakers that we're going to have because they can speak a certain way. And I see that a lot with youth organizing specifically, um, especially when thinking of folks who are in in college versus folks who aren't. There's like a big difference between who they ask to speak at events or who they ask um, to really engage with their like donors or their just different audiences. It's like the effort and time it takes to teach someone how to just tell their story. They don't necessarily want to invest that time and that effort into someone who may not be in, on the level as a person who has gone to college and got that experience with speaking in public on a lot. So I think that that's that's really important to think about when folks are thinking um, of like how to make their movements more accessible. It's really uh, amazing, like hearing the perspective you bring because it's also making me realize so many different intersections with a lot of different work that. Like when you're thinking of folks who are in poverty or low income folks uh, and trying to make a movement accessible, it's just meeting them where they are Mm -hmm. and making sure that, you know, whatever that means for them, it's as true as it can be. Because thinking of young people, it's like thinking of the times a day we have programs or thinking of the times uh, that we hold workshops or summits or thinking of the time of the school year. Like I know when we were planning our, I know that like planning a summit where we're like, ah, like you have to think of 
what folks are going to be interested in, um, what time of year works best for them. If they're in college, what does that mean financially for them getting to and from the summit? Like, I know we thought about that um, when we were planning. So I think that's like something folks look over that is very important to have people included. It's very big, even if it may not sound as big as it is. Also, the cultural differences. When you pull a lot of people together in a summit or a conference or something, I don't know if this came up for you, but food and smoking. So you are being classist if you do not make a place for people to smoke because there's a huge correlation with class. Make it culturally comfortable for whoever is going to feel like they're on the margins, whether that's by class, by race, by age, whatever. It sounds like you all do a good job of that. I I absolutely love what you said about smoking areas um, because so many people in my family smoke and it's because like low income people, but, and of course, specifically low income black communities for a long, long time were targeted by um, big tobacco. And that's why it's still so prominent 10, 15, 20 years later after this, even the targeting has ended. And, and I'm so happy that you pointed that out because I think so many times, even I can catch myself having family members who are smokers, who are in living in low-income communities where smoking is so prominent. Although I do not smoke, I sometimes catch within advocacy and organizing spaces, not having that reality shown because there's no planners who are low-income, who do come from these communities that um, were heavily influenced by big tobacco. And I'm just so happy that you brought that up because I feel like <laughs> we don't talk about class enough, whether it be in the gun violence prevention movement or any movement spaces I've been in. So thank you a million times over. And we kind of talked earlier for a second about language and sort of this, this next topic that um, we wanted to get to, it, we wanted to connect it to gun violence prevention a little bit more. Um, so we often see terms like gun control or restrictions to gun access as the solution to gun violence and the gun violence epidemic at large. We know that not to be true here at Not My Generation, but it is often said to be the answer because of this oversaturation of white and often affluent organizers, um, wealthier folks, of course. I, I really want to know from your experience and the work that you do, in what ways is policy impacted by the lack of inclusion of low-income peoples, whether it be um, as representatives or just being a part of advocacy organizations? Yeah, well, so much of the institutions we see, whether it's criminal justice or education or healthcare or workplaces, the, the policies have been set by professional people talking to other professionals, professionals who are lobbyists, talking to professionals who are legislators, consulting uh, expertise from professional academics and researchers. And, you know, it's not just the backroom deals, but even what happens openly, like, hey, we had a public hearing and that's who came. So I've been a community organizer a bunch and had helped people directly affected by some problem to come together as a group, get that empowerment that we we're talking about of like, you can tell your story and make an organized force, organized pressure. It takes a lot more low income or working class, unorganized working class. Sometimes unions obviously have managed to get some rapidly eroding clout, but, um, but non-union member working class people and poor people, you have to have a lot more people power, putting on a lot more types of pressure to make as much headway as when just professional lobbyists or insiders work out legislation. Um, so that's what we need in this country. We need a lot more grassroots groups. Um, of course, I'm overjoyed at the uh, impact that the newest wave of Black Lives Matter movement is uh, is having, things that we've just wanted for so long. And this is like, my activist soul is like, yeah, this is how it should work. Like everybody comes out, the directly affected people and the allies, and we don't just stand on the street corners and educate each other. We also, we organize targeted campaigns and we pressure every decision-making body to put it into law, put it into policy, change the practices. I mean, this is, I see this as, as an anti-classist movement as well as an anti-racist movement because there's so many grassroots people involved. Um, I don't know if everybody else is thinking of it that way, but this is, this is what it takes. You got to organize, you got to organize locally, as well as connect with each other and, and um, do public messaging nationally, internationally. Everything that's been happening 
since the beginning of the Black Lives Matter movement in 2014, I'd say everything has been done right. So every other institution, just like police reform and the criminal justice system is having these targeted, focused, effective campaigns, pressure campaigns on decision makers, that's what we need on, you know, this is, this is horrific. What's happening, what's about to happen with people becoming uninsured just as they're getting sick with the pandemic. The massive wave of evictions and foreclosures we're probably about to see unless government intervenes. Like the same thing we're seeing now with Black Lives Matter. We need that same kind of everybody on board, everybody organized on these other institutions as well. I'm just curious, how do we get to that point? Because I think sometimes, specifically when I do my community organizing efforts um, with the collective of our community, of course, how can we get everyone on board? I feel like that's always the big question no one has the answers to. I feel like even getting workers on board because of the way our economy is set up is difficult sometimes. What are some ways that you've seen it work? I've seen it work through the old fashioned methods of, you know, knocking on doors or one-on-one -on -one outreach, drawing people, having, having things organized on a, we used to call them affinity groups, but now some people say pods. I hear some Black Lives Matter people call them pods. Get small groups that are federated into bigger groups so everybody has a role. Lots and lots of training, capacity building, organization building. The really terrible pitfall right now is that people think they are getting involved by clicking something online and the, the leadership development that's needed, the trust and community building that's needed, the strategy, capacity to strategize in real time, it doesn't happen. The, the capacity to reach out to millions of people has never been so easy. I'm telling you, the pre-internet days, it was much harder. And I did organize national movements, but it was much harder than it is now to get people aware of the issue and to get people sort of you know, saying thumbs up, yes, I signed this thing and I put my name in. I, do some virtue signaling. There's a great book called uh, Twitter and Tear Gas that I'm unfortunately not going to be able to call the author's name, but that's uh, studied this internationally because all these authoritarian regimes are getting mass movements um, organized online, which is astonishing um, in great fear of, of repression to the point of just mass killing. Um, but they don't win their goals because the people haven't met each other they haven't really built trust in certain leaders. Um, they don't have the capacity to dialogue about strategy and they haven't done the organizational develop capacity development or the training or the leadership development that's needed. So uh, they're getting squashed again around the world. So we got to be real aware of that here, especially with the younger generation where um, life is on, especially right now, life is online, right? Um, that no, you have to, you have to do collective action, which you can do in a disconnected way if it's like a boycott or something. I bet your movement has, has done a lot of really good boycotts of, of stores and things like that. But yeah, you just don't think that you've done it if you've built a huge social media presence. Absolutely. <laughs> I, think, I think that's the hardest part sometimes because everyone is so consumed with the online world, and especially being young. I started organizing and a lot of it was virtual because we we're like, oh, planning in this Google Doc and oh, planning in like this spreadsheet, you know. But oftentimes um, these large corporations, they work with law enforcement. So like anti-policing, um, police abolition efforts are often stifled because of big tech coming in and selling all of your data or releasing it to law enforcement. Um, so I think that brings a good point specifically to our young listeners that are listening to sort of engage outside of internet spaces like it's not always fun to write things on paper, but one of my personal favorite things is with the very war room-esque vibes where we're like drawing on whiteboards and we're like yeah, making right. all these connections. Like that's just how like I remember organizing, like my favorite parts of organizing because it's yeah. like we're really putting the pedal to the metal right now. We're all in a room together. It's a little difficult right now, of course, but I, I appreciate you pointing that out. It can happen through Zoom. I've, I'm, there's activist training and leadership development happening where people are not physically in the room mm -hmm. together like Zoom whiteboards, I like, your, I like the whiteboards too, like you're saying. It can happen, but it just needs to be person to person, people mm -hmm. investing in people and building trust with people um, and leadership. 
One of the things I found in my research was uh, very different attitudes towards leadership by class and that there is a knee-jerk anti-leader like that is in the upper middle class movements where that's most of who the, the members are of like, oh, we're all leaders or which is, you know, there is room for all of us to be leaders, but that we don't have leaders here. We think leadership is, is hierarchy and domination. And if there's no leader, there's nobody to be the inspiring leadership development, you know, the inspiring mentor. And it was almost universal because I was studying a lot of different kinds of low income and working class groups like labor coalitions and women on welfare advocacy groups and um, you know, just all kinds of affordable housing and, and stuff. So uh, all different neighborhood groups. The one thing that cut across was people knew who the leaders were. They loved the leaders. People were leaders because everybody trusted them to be working for the, the collective good, working for the empowerment of the group and everybody in it, in a way that really would be culturally not allowed in, say, an environmental group with a lot of green advocacy groups, uh, membership groups. It really wouldn't be tolerated to have someone that people just, they, these, these grassroots working class leaders had an extraordinary number of one-on-one -on -one relationships of trust and mentoring. They were like these hubs. And obviously, if you ever use that position for your own advancement or you betray the members, then you're a corrupt leader and hopefully people stop trusting you and you're out of there. But that's not always the case. I don't know if you know the book about Ella Baker during the Civil Rights Movement. She was this extraordinary leader. She said, young people, you should organize separately. Don't just be a youth wing of SCLC. You should have a youth organization. And tons of them knew her, trusted her, got mentored into movement building skills from her. Um, and I think that comes out of the African-American tradition, but it comes out of other working class movement traditions as well. That is actually really interesting because I feel, I feel like the way you're describing leadership might be a little bit different than the way that I look at leadership. Um, because when I think of leadership, I think of like a very hierarchical sort of standpoint, like like an organization mimicking the um, United States government. So like you have the president, the vice president, and that to me is like very negative. But I think when you just started describing it, though, when you were talking more so about the one on one relationships and building that community, it almost to me, I would describe that as a communal leadership. You've rebuilt um, that sense of trust. And like if the one person who you know is very, very, very active in a movement steps back for a little bit, since there is that communal trust still and that, um, that mentoring, for lack of a better term, it helps it stay alive. It helps it stay afloat. So I think that gives me something to think about, really, because yeah. I'm very anti-hierarchy, but I don't, it's, I'm more communal support. In grassroots organizing, the negative thing of traditional hierarchy, of command and control, top-down, it doesn't work because volunteers cannot be commanded. There, you know, there used to be these sectarian left groups that would try. There's, oh, I could tell you stories, but there was somewhere there was, there was a leader who told everybody, this is the party line. And this is, if you go out into this coalition, this is the position you have to represent. And this is what you have to do. And those groups stayed extremely small because that doesn't, that doesn't work with volunteers. Volunteers only stay if it's an enlivening situation that draws out your voice and your strength and stuff. So, yeah, I don't worry too much. Some of the groups did seem a little hierarchical, as in some people identified, like, I just want, I want to be here and support and be a follower, which is something, it's a positive role that exists more in working class communities, I think, um, in there was this one story, uh, this book I love, but I won't go off too much on it, but it was an environmental group on the West Coast, no surprise, but their um, average education was around master's degree of the members of the group. And the group had as many projects as it had members because everybody started their own project. Because we're trained, speaking as somebody, I was trained to manage you know, and to think you're supposed to be in charge. And so this thing, it's actually a real, I think it's a healthy thing that 
this is what the Midwest Academy treats people when they do the community organizing training. It's like leaders are people with followers. If you just get up on a soapbox and you're a really good talker or something, that doesn't make you a leader. Or you just think you're the center of the movement. That doesn't make you a leader. You're a leader if when you call for an action, people come for the action. You know, you, you, you inspire, you draw people in. That's leadership. And there is a really healthy role um, that I've seen a lot in a lot mm -hmm. of different working class and low income communities for like, well, I'm just going to pitch in. I'm, I, I'm, I'm inspired by this person, by this cause, by this organization, by this leader. I'm going to be a helper. I'm going to be a follower. Um, personally, I think that's healthy. I know it's going against the grain. I have a different take and I think it's because I've gotten to work with so many healthy working class groups. Yeah, hearing the way you talk about leadership, it's interesting because um, in doing youth work, since that's like where I've been doing a lot of work um, as well, the best way I can describe it is that everyone's scared to say they're a leader because they don't, this image that they have of what that means is like a powerful one person. Right. And we try to teach like that everyone can show up as a leader in whatever ways that looks like. And so like, when like talking to my friends, they're like, well, I don't really go out and do protests, but I talk to family members about how they can be more inclusive. And they're like, that's not really advocacy, right? And I'm like, that's literally advocacy. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, and it's just like, people think that you have to commit so much time and effort and energy to a movement to be considered a leader when it's you understanding that this is an issue and you doing something to try and further that issue with whatever capacity you have is movement building. It's leadership building. And I think people fail to realize that because like I've spoke at places, I've uh, been a part of video projects or something like I've had the chance to hi get highlighted like that. But I always like to emphasize to folks that I like I have used these instances to further the work I do, but that doesn't mean that I'm furthering the movement as a whole just because I'm like taking these opportunities. It doesn't mean that like I'm going to be the be all end all for how this all works. It's I'm just a really small piece in a really big puzzle. And that's not bad. And I think um, when you like break down what leadership means and really show folks that there are different ways you can show up and it's still valuable, that's really important because like you might have that one person who can call the action, right? But if those people don't feel like they want to go, then what movement do you have? It's like, it's not there. Those pieces, those people that are considered followers are one of the most vital parts of a movement. Right, that's right. So it's like when, I think it's so important to think about, especially when thinking about leadership, that like, it isn't this one concrete thing. And it is actually way more accessible than people like to admit. It's, you can, anyone can be a leader, right. but it's when you try and put yourself in this definition that we've already been presented with what a leader is, is where you might feel like there's a disparity when there's, there is none. It's just us doing work together to further a cause that we know we're either greatly impacted by or are wanting to, you know, build an equitable future for. So the, the essence of being a good community organizer is that person that you're, t you're affirming. So you're doing that first step, like, wow, you talk to your family members. Yes, that's advocacy. Your family members might be the toughest ones to convince, good for you. It's that next invitation, that the classic community organizing method, that you give somebody, if somebody's in a very small role, will they take one step? Hey, would you come at the next meeting? Would you tell us some of the things that have worked it, with your family members? Oh, that's really great. Um, so, um, okay, well, um, could, would you be willing to practice that with your neighbors as well, or we're going out to do some public persuasion. You seem really persuasive, would you come? Just like tiny roll, next roll, next roll. It's like a set of stairs, like leadership development is like a set of stairs. I honestly feel like we could probably have a whole entire episode about leadership and like what that means. <laughs> like I feel like we could go on about this for hours, if not days, if not months. People spend their whole entire careers working on leadership development and what exactly leadership is, so. I know um, from what I've read up about you, I'm assuming that's part of the work that you do as well. Um, and it seems very at the core of what's really being done. And I think that's something the gun violence prevention movement needs to take into consideration, especially when we're looking at the breaking down of egos in rather than being the center of attention, um, being uh, sort of this idea of the connector, connecting them to knowledge, connecting them to resources, um, connecting them to the collective power. Um, I would say because I, I'm really, from your from your take on like 
anti-hierarchical people. I would consider myself an anti-hierarchical person, but I agree with that, that idea of leadership that you have because it's less about like getting up and speaking and like, oh, everybody knows you. And it's more so of like people are connected to your work and they want to get engaged with your work and you train them and you mobilize folks. So we at Root Causes, um, we at Not My Generation, we consider ourselves a extremely progressive and a lot of us are anti-capitalist. Um, we have this perspective um, because we understand how class oppression can and will lead to um, violence specifically in the United States by intercommunal conflicts and systems of oppression like that of the prison industrial complex, big agriculture, big pharma, um, large corporate housing developers, and so many, so many other large institutions that are just reinforcing classism and reinforcing this divide. So we like to think about the systems um, and, and the oppression that can come with that when we are in spaces and we're trying to build movements. Now, I understand that movement spaces can be, as we've talked about, very classist in Congress as well. Um, and I, I really, we touched on this a little bit in the episode, but where do you think that to sort of break down that divide, to really start to even out wealth inequality, to even out um, income inequality, so we don't have as much as that divide. Where do you think that can be done? Whether it be through small or larger structural changes, how can we make it a more equitable world so we don't even really have this United States view of poverty? Yeah, I mean, it's a very deep question with many, many answers. Um, I think, um, you know, we, public opinion right now, we really do have most Americans with us on that, rich people are too rich and tax too lightly and um, that a lot of our systems are not working. We may be divided um, on some of the solutions, but um, there really is the potential for a mass movement for um, economic fairness. And um, so one thing is just to wage those campaigns. We, we've um, had a long relationship, class action has had a long relationship with the United for a Fair Economy and also uh, the project at the Institute for Policy Studies. Do you know the website inequality.org? Mm -hmm. um, that's we overlap with, with them a lot. And um, uh, so spotlighting certain rule changes, like tax increases on wealthy people or big corporations that would free up money for the kinds of community investments that we especially right need, need at this particular time. Um, so that's part of it is publicizing and drawing people in to frame that this is the core this is the core problem and you don't have to be we don't only want we don't want a movement that only has anti-capitalists in it you know um but you can be a pretty far across the political spectrum and still think something is really really wrong with this uh, economy dominated by the wealthy so that's part of it but the reason we a lot of us in class action, we, um, that's our past, is organizing for legislative change on economic justice issues of all kinds. And we gradually realized that the ways that we're divided from each other by class and the stereotypes, the classist stereotypes, and even the wedges that get driven between very poor people and working class and lower middle class people, um, that that has got, to, before we can have this mass movement, that has got to be solved. So you have to tackle stereotypes of working class and poor people. Um, and um, there's a lot of leftists who sympathize with poor people, but sort of think especially white working class people and lower middle class people are the problem. And that's just classism, that's just classism. You know, white working class people are, the biggest race class group in this country. They're incredibly ideologically diverse, tons of potential activists and potential allies there. So setting up situations where people can get real about class, can share their class life stories, um, can say, well, wherever you're coming from, you can want a, a less classist country. That's sort of where class action keeps our focus. We do these wonderful workshops where, um, people do get a chance to share things about their class of origin and really hear each other and value each other as human beings and then really tackle even the subtle and cultural kinds of classism within their, their organizations and institutions. So 
Um, yeah, so I think you gotta, you gotta always think structural and you gotta think interpersonal, cultural. It's always gotta be both and just, I think the anti-racist movement is really getting that right these days of like, gotta tackle the laws, gotta tackle the, the consciousness and the implicit bias and the internalized racism. Same applies to class, but there's very few people doing that. Um, except for this one organization, which is why I've stayed so closely affiliated with it for 15 years. I think it's really a unique niche. That was such a beautiful way to <laughs> like wrap, wrap up such a wonderful conversation. Also. I know, I love talking to you guys. I wish <laughs> I knew you and we are in the same town. And... <laughs> I know, this is just, it's been wonderful like listening uh, to like just your experiences and really getting an understanding of like, how the movement has worked from the past and up until now. I think that's really awesome to be able to get that history to a movement as well. Um, so I really do want to thank you for taking the time to speak with us and uh, yeah. really helping us understand like class oppression and the different ways it can intersect with gun violence and just understanding it as its own system as well. We really, we really had a great conversation. I know I did. I, I feel like I can speak for Elijah this time uh, of that. It was a great conversation and we really hope to be able to work with you again soon. Thank you for listening to episode seven of Root Causes, a Not My Generation podcast, where we discuss class oppression in the movement with Betsy Leander Wright. Please join us next Tuesday for an episode about voter suppression and gun violence. In solidarity, Elijah Nichols, Addison Moore, and Betsy Leander Wright.